The band's name comes from a song by Talking Heads, but during their first years as a group in Oxford in the late 80s, they were known as On a Friday. Briefly. We changed band name, um, you know, weekly, if not daily. We called everything from White Hotel to... It was because we weren't doing concerts. We never played live. We rehearsed obsessively, but we just never played concerts ever, ever, ever. We'd do one a year or something, but rehearse three times, four times a week. It just felt like writing songs and recording was more interesting than inflicting it on anybody. In 1991, Radiohead signed to the British Parlophone label, the record label that 29 years earlier had been the only one in all of London willing to take a punt on the Beatles. Luckily, Radiohead had had a little less trouble attracting record company interest than that other group. Well, they're quite cowardly people. If you get two or three companies interested, then the others will watch their backs and turn up. It's not that they were actually interested or had heard of us, I don't think. These things get whipped up. It happens to most bands, really. So why don't you go for Parlophone? Is it because of the history of, of the label? Or? Not really. I don't know. Well, they... Lots of reasons. They had, they had Blur and they had Morrissey and they seemed to be saying we could do what we want. It's, it's funny. Um, major labels are actually quite flexible for a while. They let you do what you want and if things go wrong, then they, I think they step in and it all gets a bit... But, you know, they're quite trusting. It's sort of strange. We expected far more intervention than we got. So, I mean, was all of this kind of thing part of the big plan when you were rehearsing obsessively ten years well, ago? Well, I don't know what we were planning. I mean, that, that's the funny thing. I don't... There was never a goal, really. I think we wanted to do better recordings. We wanted to get into a studio and record properly and get obsessed with it, but I don't know. The rest of it's just all, all happened. There was never, we never imagined touring or leaving the country or releasing records outside of England, really. Upon its initial release in late 92, Radiohead's single Creep failed to sell in the UK. But in America, the song became a slacker anthem and a monster hit. When you were before, Did you give in to any of the US record company expectations well, at the time of Creep? Well, it's funny because they, they um, made a prediction of how many records they planned to sell of OK Computer before they heard the record. And then they heard the record and they cut the prediction in half, or quarter, I think. So that's never been a problem with us, you know. They've never overly hyped us or expected much from us. Good evening, we're... On the tales of the success of Creep, Radiohead toured America, playing in front of audiences who only wanted to hear them play their radio hit and weren't terribly interested in the rest of the material on Pablo Honey. In a way, Creep became an albatross around their necks. It's funny, I mean, on, on one side it... it sped things up for us because it meant that Radiohead became... Um, we never felt that, that Radiohead was successful, we felt Creep was successful. But it got our name put about, so that sped things up for us. But at the same time, it meant that we recorded our second album about a year late. I mean, the Benz, most of it was written, you know, within months of, of recording our first record. And we had to tour and tour and we couldn't stop to record. So that slowed things down for us. The 1995 album, The Benz, was recorded in a regular recording studio. OK Computer, however, was made in Jane Seymour's mansion near Bath. Does it really help with the atmosphere? It does, because you're not, you haven't got uh, all the gold discs of, of the last band that were in there on the wall. You don't have to walk past status quo albums. and oh, it's, just, it's just very depressing. You turn up in most studios and you still have the body odour or the, the copies of Playboy of the previous band and you just want to and start from scratch. But instead we set up in a library and it was just a bit, a bit less um, traditional. Is it fun recording an album over a year? No, we only spent two and a half months actually recording. We just spent a lot of time rehearsing and doing other stuff, really. We could never spend 12 months in the studio. No, terrible. Was it a consciously recorded concept album? No, no preconception anyway. These things always appear afterwards. I mean. The Benz is full of stuff about hospitals and illness, but that was only noticed afterwards, really. I don't know, yeah, there's lots of stuff about speed, I think. There's lots of stuff about things happening too quickly. I know Tom's quite obsessed about people climbing into cars every morning and going to work and, and having a high likelihood of not getting there. And that surfaces here and there. In the Q magazine readers' poll for the greatest albums ever, the Beatles' Revolver was at number two. 
We asked Johnny Greenwood for his reaction to having his album voted number one, the best album of all time. I don't know, you know, time will tell. We could be as irrelevant as, as I'm sure Van de Graaff Generator will probably give an album of the year in 1972 or something, and then who likes them now, you know? So it's, it's hard. I mean, I was talking to someone about this the other day, and they were saying that Revolver is a better record. But having said that, the songs on it meant nothing, mean nothing to him because they're, they're as traditional as a Beethoven record. They're not really, they don't, Taxman doesn't mean anything to him. But this Verve song or this Oasis song or this Radiohead song, he heard when he first met his girlfriend or he heard when, and so the music means more to you. So that makes it more understandable slightly. So in, in terms of the huge kind of acclaim that OK Computer's had, is it irrelevant to you, to what you do? No, I mean, I, well, I get very suspicious when, when bands say they don't think about their audience and they do music for themselves, and I never really believe that. I mean, it always feels to me like we're doing music for people who bought our last record, and if they don't understand what we're doing now or they hate what we're doing now, then we've gone wrong, I think. We did what we wanted for our second album, and we ignored all advice. Uh, and like the first record. So, so we, we ignored all the advice and put out a record and attracted a certain number of people. So it just feels like we should do that again. I mean, when I say you've got an audience in mind, you don't, you don't look at sales figures, but you do play it to your friends in Oxford. And if they think you've completely lost it, and it's, they're probably right, you know. Everyone has their musical influences, and there are some seemingly obvious ones on OK Computer. So who are Johnny and Radiohead most influenced by? I don't, I don't know. They're, all this, they're changing all the time. I mean, like I say, I, I'm, I'm good at writing off areas of music and then discovering that I love whole hordes of it. Like I always found a lot of dub stuff, dub reggae stuff. I didn't didn't really like it. And then I got some Horace Andy and uh, a Scientist meets um, Space Invaders. It's another yeah. amazing album. And then just found myself trying to copy sounds from that kind of record. Um, that had similar things with, with people like, you know, Olivia Messiaen and Scott Walker. We, we tried to, and Miles Davis has been a big influence on this record, um, Bitches Brew especially. So um, we're happy to, to steal anything from anywhere, really. There are some very loving tributes, I think, to Pink Floyd on um, Exit Music. Pink Floyd on Exit Music? It's yeah. a new one, OK. It hasn't been brought up before. No, Pink Floyd's been a new discovery for me. It's only been a year or so since I've been, I started listening to them. Traditionally, Pink Floyd were terrible. Everybody who liked them at school were all, always extremely boring people. And, and the only, only record I remember coming out was The Wall, which I hated and I don't really like now either. But then I just discovered all the early Pink Floyd and I was very impressed. And that's great. Yeah, only a new influence for us. Sort of, they got a bit old, I think, but it comes to us all. Progressive rock albums you've been delving into? Yeah, I try to. Um, all of them are awful, unfortunately. I mean, I, I keep asking people and I keep getting recommendations for stuff, but I'm still looking. Um, I'm just prepared to accept that there's good music in everything, except possibly, I don't know, March band music. But, but there's basically good, good forms of everything. Like Country and Western, I once decided was all terrible, and then I found these early songs from the 40s and 50s that are basically all about cocaine and women and people dying. They're very, very grim and hardcore and some of the music's great. So yeah, I'm happy to be proved wrong. So, so what's it like when um, people say, OK, OK Computer is a progressive rock album? Um, I, I, I don't really care what people say very much. Progressive rock, I don't, don't think so. Uh, if you mean it's a progression, I mean, I think the Pixies are a progression in this kind of music, for example, but that doesn't really mean they sound like Genesis, does it? It's got a lot of the same sounds and instruments that yeah. progressive rock had. I mean, like yeah, we stole instruments and textures, but we just don't sing about unicorns and, no. and wander off for 20 minutes on each song. So if we can find new colours in, in records, then we'll, we'll take some. Your use of samples in music, like with uh, the Ben's exit music and uh, a reminder, the, the B-side, mm. who, who collects those? Well, we've all got mini discs, which are just very small digital recording devices, and we just we just record everything. 
usually go out with a camera in one pocket and a, and a mini disc and a microphone in the other and just record images and sounds all the time. It, it's, it's just a better version of using a, a video camera, I think. Seven seconds until the water drains away. Do you have much of a hand in, in your videos, the concept of them? In as much as we spend quite a lot of time looking at work of, of directors and new directors and, and students and um, I don't know, we're quite into letting people do what they want. There's one band who used to turn up at EMI, this is about five years ago, I can't tell you who they were, but they used to turn up to video showings with stopwatches and time each other's lengths of appearance in their videos to make sure the keyboard player wasn't in any longer than the drummer. <laughs> so we heard the story quite early on and decided that that was the way to not do it which is why we don't really, we try not to be in, in them because they just get in the way of a, a director's idea really. Good idea for a film and, and then he's got to wedge five unsigmatic people into his film so we kind of, we try and be outside it really. They must do as much for you as, as Radio Airplay, if not normal. Funnily, funnily no, not in America, there's not, um, I don't know, it all gets put in perspective by um, the Romeo and Juliet soundtrack um, that has one of our B-sides on has sold, you know, four times as many as any of our albums, so you just don't really worry about it. Really. It's all about radio and getting your songs on films and da-da-da. So. Speaking of films, you've, you and Tom have just mm. been doing a collaboration with Michael Stipe for Velvet Goldmine. That's right, yeah, we did some covers of um, some very obscure Roxy Music songs, which I'd never heard. I'd never heard any Roxy Music, so... A uh, song's called 2HB, Bittersweet, and... Um, third one which escapes me, but very sort of glam, early, peculiar, Brian Eno-influenced glam rock, very strange music. He uh, described it to us as being, um, as just getting together and putting on lots of um, eye makeup and glamming up and just having fun for a couple of days, which it was really, it wasn't much thought put into it. On MTV you did a performance of Nobody Does It Better. Right. It's funny, we've only done that, played that song twice, once on television and once in a concert. Um, and we only played it on television because we had to do a cover. We had to do someone else's song and it was, that just suggested itself. But we, don't, we don't really like torturing other people's songs. Each song on Radiohead's albums is co-written by all the members of the band. Yeah, Tom does the lyrics and usually kicks off the song, writes the majority of it or a tiny part of it and things just get extended and altered and butchered by the rest of us usually. Is it usually the, the song title that, that starts the song? Yeah, titles usually come first with us. I'm quite fond of titles and words and kicking stuff around, yes. Well, the album title used to be um, a song, but the song got, got you know left behind and discarded. We just kept the title, so... The original title was Ones and Zeros, wasn't it? No, we had hundreds of titles. Oh, okay. I don't remember using that one. Oh, that's the one I read about. Yeah, I, I read that too. I don't know where that was from. Do you read a lot of things that are completely false? About us? Um, I don't read a lot of stuff about us, if I can. Yet nothing damaging. As usual for most international bands, the new CD has to be supported by an international tour. Some bands exclaim at the end of an overlong tour, never again. But it isn't always regarded as such hard slog. Parts of it are quite healthy for us because it can panic you into getting the songs better faster when, when you start playing new songs live and they're not quite right. It sort of it speeds the process up. And there's lots of free time and there are instruments lying around all the time, so it's quite conducive for writing and rehearsing. So it's, it's good for a while. It's funny, we played Auckland last night and I think we sweated out every illness we've had so far in the past three weeks, so it's not such an unhealthy lifestyle. I love it anyway, love travelling, love touring, usually. With the records being so dynamic and seemingly painstakingly recorded, how is it that Radiohead can so faithfully recreate the songs on stage? It's not very hard to, to reproduce what we do on record because A, there's so many of us, and there's so many instruments lying around the stage. And uh, also, we're all quite prepared to do nothing for half a song. We all realise that if, if we're needed for 10 seconds in the middle of one song, and that's all, then that's, that's what we do. Nobody complains. It's sort of because we don't enjoy it that much. We don't enjoy, you know, putting the head down and just playing for an hour and a half. It's not really the point. So you don't, you don't enjoy performing live that much? Well, we do, but it's not, 
not for the sake of it, not to have a guitar and a neck and no, it's kind of like being a, a percussion section of an orchestra. There's, there's occasionally quite a lot of counting, which is fine, you know, which is which we don't complain about. No one wants to play solos or takes a lead really. So if it wasn't for the industry and the way it works, would you still be happy to kind of get together in a bedroom and, and play songs and put out albums without doing the touring and live stuff? Well, that's what OK Computer felt. Um, admittedly, Jane Seymour's library is not like my bedroom, but it was a similar thing again, because suddenly there were only five of us and someone else who, who had the equipment. It was the same thing. You weren't thinking of what the studio charges by the hour. You weren't thinking of the band that were coming in the following week. Due to problems with occupational overuse syndrome, when Johnny plays guitar on tour, he wears an arm brace. I mean, mm. you hit those strings pretty hard. Yeah, but I, I'm just sort of clumsy, really, and well coordinated. There's no, there's no um, strength or bravado in, in what I do. I just not doing it properly. I think. He's often referred to as the lead guitarist, but Johnny spends almost as much time on keyboards and other instruments, and can move from synth to guitar at lightning speed. I'm just not that enamoured with the guitar or, or anything else, really. I'm yet to find an instrument that's really obsessed me. So I'm, I'm happy to just get around from Glockenspiel to, to, to whatever else the song needs. Really. Sleep tight. <laughs> Texan stand-up comic and social critic Bill Hicks died in 1994 from pancreatic cancer. Radiohead's The Benz was dedicated to Hicks. Yeah, we quite like dark humour. I think it's quite a British obsession, actually. I don't know how it translates, but yeah, he, he, he saw things quite accurately, I think. I think comedians tend to be slightly over-worshipped, especially in, in England. There's sort of, a lot of the newspaper columns now are being written by comedians, which can be quite wearing, but, but Bill Hicks is different. He's quite, like I say, very dark indeed. Do you see The Benz and OK Computer as being dark albums, but with more humour than people give them credit for? But I think a computer is a very light album, actually. I think it's very... I always say it's like the artwork. The artwork is meant to be like the music. It's, I don't know if you've seen the cover, but it's, it's lots of stolen, muddy and jumbled images that have all been scribbled out with white ink. So it's, it's very white and, and clean-looking, but with all this dirt and mess underneath that you can make out bits of. But it's meant to be like that. I don't know if you've seen the film Fargo. It's meant to sound like that looks, in a way. Are there any songs from, from your past repertoire that you hate? Uh, it seems like there's always a song or two on every album which is kind of dead end and isn't going anywhere. And um, I don't know about a computer. I'm starting to think maybe electioneering is the end of something for us. You know, it's all right, but there's nothing to come after it that's like it, maybe. I mean, it always felt like high and dry on the bends, but it's a good pop song. and and it's all right, but it felt like it was the end of something, you know, like we'd finished that kind of thing. High and Dry from Radiohead's second album, The Benz, was a radio hit in many countries, but failed to top the success of Creep, particularly in America. <laughs> Are you tired of, of Creep, everybody talking about Creep, of playing Creep? Um, Do you still play Creep in, in concert? Um, yeah, we did it last night. Tired of it. Not really. It depends where we are. I mean, you know, we haven't been to New Zealand for two and a half years and we didn't tour the Benz here, and so the last record we toured here was Pablo Honey and it had creep on, so... We did interviews yesterday and it kind of that, that kept coming up and I was a bit exasperated, but, but then you think we haven't been here for so long, it's understandable. We did an interview in America uh, only a few months ago, um, somewhere right in the middle of nowhere, and they said... OK Computer is very different from um, your last record, Pablo Honey. What have you been doing? And it was, you know, suddenly a whole <laughs> three years of our life had been wiped out. So it depends how often you visit these places, I think. Now, you're, you're all still living in, in Oxford. What's the reaction been like at, at home from friends, family? It's just starting to get weird. It's just starting to get, you know, people knocking on my door and people and newspaper printing where I live and stuff. In fact, it's very strange. I thought nobody would be interested. Um, I don't know, for selfish reasons, I'm quite happy to see Tom on the cover of magazines and stuff. I'm never. But that's only because it means that we get bothered less. Um, 
uh, any new experience is, is interesting for, for a bit, so I can't imagine it lasting. So you're not famously rich and rolling the money yet? No, it's, um, we've got enough to carry on and do the next record. Um, it's funny, you're sort of permanently in, in debt in a way, because the record company funds your record and you pay them back with the sales. And then the following year, they, they, they give you another lump of money that's got to fund you for the next year. And it's got to pay for the recording and all the touring. And so it's, 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 it's good. It just, you feel like you're kind of in gainful employment. And things carry on, that's all. Are you, are you writing while you're on tour? Yeah. There's, there's about eight or nine songs and, and bits and pieces. So what's the time frame? Supposedly we've got as long as we want, but I think that's pretty dangerous. I mean, I think I'd, I'd happily start next week. And I'm, I'm also finishing soon to myself. Around the world, there are millions of people, myself included, who can't wait for the fourth Radiohead album. But in the meantime, OK Computer will do very nicely. It's an album I cannot get enough of. It's my favourite album of the decade, I have to say. I will I don't keep want to looking. Gush. Not two years ago.